Our next speaker is Luis DiCioli. He's the lead software engineer at Grove Labs, a hardware startup that sells a web-connected in-home farming appliance about the size of a bookshelf, which makes it easy for anyone to grow fresh fruits and vegetables indoor all year round. The Grove appliance is self-managing, and its operating system is built with Meteor. Lewis will be speaking to us about making things that are connected to the internet. Please welcome Lewis. Hi, everyone. So like Al said, uh, my name is Louis DiCioli. I am the lead software at Grove Labs. Uh, and the title of my talk changed a little, uh, Microchips and Monocots. I'm going to tell you the story of making the Grove ecosystem so far. So I flew out here from Boston. I thought I was going to win for distance. I didn't know they'd be flying them in from Sweden. But you may have heard we had a bit of a bad winter, had a little bit of snow. So it's funny that we made this system you could grow all year round and possibly the worst winter I'll ever see. Uh, but it makes it pretty fitting that now we can go th grow right through it. Uh, so this is me back when I still had my snow shield on my face. Um, it's where you can find me on the internet. Uh, I graduated from MIT last year, 6'2", if you know what that means, computer engineering. Uh, I transferred there from the Air Force Academy after two years. I think that was a good interplay. One taught me attention to detail, and one taught me how to learn. Uh, my first web app, first line of JavaScript, were both in fall of 2013. And I say that because I am still an amateur. I've been at this for barely over a year now uh, with the company, I'm still learning every day about how things are done. So just because I went to a fancy school doesn't mean you should listen to me any more than anyone else on the web. So Grove. Uh, what is Grove? Let's say, what is a Grove? A Grove is a living ecosystem in your home. What does that mean? That means this. So right now in Boston, there are 50 different people who have these in their homes. What you're looking at is a in-home aquaponic system. This is a two-tower grove. So those are actually separate units. You plug them in together at the bottom so they can share water. Uh, you'll see that there's a fish tank in the bottom right. It uses aquaponics, and I'll explain what that means. There's an LED light in each plot, as we call them, the growing sections. Uh, this is a bunch of shallow plots, meaning it's meant for leafing greens or herbs. Uh, we also have an, another tower that can do fruiting plots, uh, fruiting plants, sorry. So when you open up the doors of the grove, this is what you see. So the one on the left is the, the fruiting system, like I mentioned. Uh, you'll see that there's plastic uh, bins in each of them. Those are where the plants sit, suspended. There's not media in the sense that you think of soil. They don't sit in anything uh, and grow. We do have some hydro, uh, pebbles, it's called hydroton, in the deep one, you can kind of see that, and we'll get a better shot later. But we're so excited to finally put this in people's homes. Uh, it uses a thing called ecoponics. So how many people have heard of hydroponics or grown at home, anything like that? Yeah? So ecoponics is kind of this, not opposite, but very different school of thought than hydroponics. Hydroponics is very sterile. You control exactly what's given to the system. You want to make sure that nothing bad is coming in. That's because it's inherently unstable. When you're trying to grow it like a science experiment, it doesn't have any way to stabilize itself like you do in nature. In ecoponics, which aquaponics is one part of, you're trying to cultivate an ecosystem within your system. That means that it's open air. It's not behind glass. Uh, you have natural sources of nitrogen that are going into the system. And it's kind of just a lot more fun. It's also uh, easier to manage. It's a lot less things you have to do day to day. After your system kind of locks in, the only thing you have to do is feed your fish. So like I said, aquaponics is a version of ecoponics. Uh, they are the source of nitrogen. So they poop, and in their poop is ammonia. And then there are bacteria in the system that break that ammonia down into nitrite. There's other bacteria in it that break down into nitrate. And then the nitrate is the fertilizer for the plants. So here you're looking at another shallow grow bed. This one, instead of sitting in the pots like you see in the back, this is just an open media bed with the hydroton. This is uh, microgreens of arugula going really well. This is in one of our team members' groves. Uh, and the bacteria really love the hydroton, those pebbles you see. It's expanded clay because there's thousands of tiny little pores in there that they can grow inside. You're not limited to growing anything specific. It's just like in nature. It depends how you cultivate your ecosystem. So you can do your herbs, greens, lettuces, arugula, chard, and you can also do your fruiting crops, so tomatoes, peppers, even tomatoes. So this is one of our customers who's grown the best tomatoes I've seen by far. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, OK, where is software in all this? 
Well, all the groves have a brain. There's a motherboard that sits at the top of each of them. It's driving our lights, it's driving our pumps. There's a few sensors in each of them. Our current ones have air temperature and humidity. Uh, future ones will also have water level, water temperature. We can even tell if your door is open or closed. It's funny how much you can tie of what's happening to if the customer is successful. And at this point, I'm going to give you a demo. Um, so this is kind of a funny way to give a demo. But for a connected device, you want to see the device. So this is the ecosystem that is in the front office back in Boston. And this is Grove OS, the app. So right now, all this is off. And we see that's because these each had a sunset of about 9.30 or 10. And there, it's about 10.30. So if I click into one of these, I can see that it had a 15-hour sunset. If I jack that guy up all the way to, well, he doesn't want to be touched. If I pause the Grove and actually just set it to movie mode, then they all come on. If I change it to photo mode, they all switch. And if I just want to turn them off, they'll all go off. I can resume the schedule, and now they're back on their normal one. You guys obviously can't hear this, but if I click this, the pumps are indeed turning on and off. Other things you can do, you can add readings to your grove. So here, the most important things in there are your water readings, your pH, your ammonia, your nitrite, your nitrate. So here, you can click in. You can see a list of them. It's telling me this is way too high. Maybe I can also add another one. It'll tell me it's too high. I'll hit Submit, and it tells me, yep, your fish are probably dead. <laughs> And click open the support post. Uh, this is fun trying to embed an iframe within a web app. Uh, we haven't done Cordova yet, so this is all browser-based. And we also use Discourse, which, which is fun to be a part of with everyone else out there using Discourse. So we can see exactly how to lower our ammonia. You can see other people's groves. I can come in here and go look at Ron's grove. Uh, not a lot going on right now. I can tell what temperature it is in his house. I can see that he's... <laughs> Not really taking his readings, but he's actually doing pretty well because Ron's had his grow for a few months, and you want those to sit close to zero after it's locked in. And that's about it. You can also, we have sandbox mode right now. So our first iteration of the light tool, usually in indoor growing, lights are purple. And that's because plants don't use green light. That's why they're green. It's the light they're reflecting. Uh, but this sits in your home, and purple's a pretty weird thing to just have this massive purple glowing box in your home. So we designed them to be white. The LED, we made our own LEDs, and they have a little bit of warm, a little bit of blue, and a, mostly neutral. So you can actually, if you go in here, you can change what that looks like for each part of the day. So right now, like I said, it's off, but if I change this to actually be later, like 11, 45, now if I move, so it's in this phase now. If I move these, no, it really doesn't want my touch. Well, you can actually go in and change the color spectrum for each part of the day so you can try and mimic which part of the other. Uh, we figured out that most people really just want to set it, and they don't know what color they want, and that's why the other one is simpler. So yeah, that's Grove OS. The rest of this presentation is going to be the story of how we made this in less than a year with only four engineers. So Grove Labs, we're about 17 people now. Uh, the software team had four of us. We've recently grown to five and had some great summer interns. And being a hardware startup is pretty sexy. There's a lot of fun physical things that go on. It's not just like being in a software startup. So we have a kick-ass YouTube channel with a video of how we mold our plastic. We did that at home. We did it ourselves how we make our cabinets. We found this awesome Boston furniture maker who makes beautiful bamboo cabinets. How we make our lights. We made them in Connecticut, right there in the USA. How we manufacture. But you know, there's not a video of us coding. I asked them to make it, but they wouldn't put it up there because it's not that exciting. I understand. But this is to talk about software. We finally get to have our spot in the light. So here's our stack. We use Meteor, of course, or else I wouldn't be here. Uh, we use Particle. If you haven't heard of Particle, they're a San Francisco-based company. They make Wi-Fi connected microcontrollers. We use Mongo, and not only because it's all Meteor works with, but because it's actually a really good use case for us. And we also use React on the front end. So I'll talk about how halfway through this, we ripped out Blaze and rewrote in React. This is a highly detailed architecture diagram of how the system works. <laughs> Uh, so you'll see on the left, that belongs to Particle. There's the Grove itself, which is the microcontroller in the top. And that communicates with Particle servers. 
Uh, when we publish out data, that comes to our receiver server, which writes those to the database after a little bit of parsing. We have our application server, which sends the application JavaScript bundle and communicates back and forth with the client. And that's written in React. That sends the messages to particle servers, which go down to the device and come all the way back to us. So when I was showing you the drop cam before, we're here in San Francisco watching the system out there. And I click that here, which came back to here. We tried to work this out in the office. There are too many errors involved. So I'll take you back to August 2014, kind of when we got started. It was me and one of the other engineers, Michael. Uh, I remember sitting in the office trying to write an HTTP client for an Arduino. Uh, if this looks familiar to you, I'm sorry. It became painfully aware as I was writing this that HTTP packets really are just text. So if you look after that first comment, send the header. That is literally print, print lining HTTP slash 1.1. And then the next line, you print your host. And then you print your application type. And then you print your content length. And then you print the actual content. And I'm sitting there asking myself, like, there's no way this can be right. Then I have to read it. I'm like, OK, while client.connected, serial.write, delay. I'm putting a delay in. Like, this was so wrong. Sitting there wondering, like, there must be a better way. We tried everything. We had Electric Imp. We made a ras put it on Raspberry Pi. We obviously, I just tried the Arduino. Intel Edison was coming out. It's like a $50 computer. Texas Instruments were like, how hard would it be to just get our own microcontroller and write our own embedded system? Real-time Linux isn't that hard, right? Wrong. <laughs> and then someone recommended Particle. So Particle is really nice because it has great abstractions. It uses the Arduino language, which means all of our skill set was still valid. We knew how to do this. But then there was a couple key functions that we got to use. So instead of having my own HTTP client, I just said spark.publish. And I say the name of it. It's a reading. Let's say that's the data, 70.4. You give it your time, time to live and private. You can actually publicly publish from Spark. It's kind of like the Twitter of the Internet of Things. And then on the server, I just say stream, And that's what I get. I get this nice, simple JSON object with exactly what I expect. It has the name. It has the data. And calling functions, same thing. So top line, we're on the device. I say spark.function update lamp, and I hand it the function that it should call when it gets a message to do that. On the server, I get the device. So that's usually a long string, not just the chip ID. Then with the device, I call the function update lamp, and that's the string that it expects. So for us, I show you, showed you all those points. That's just one like 60 character string that it expects. Then I get the result back. I just console log it, or I get an error. And just like that, I have an internet-connected device. I went from Arduino, and now I have this. And there's a lot that goes on in the background that I never had to think about. The fact that you don't really want to send HTTP from an embedded device. It uses COAP, which stands for Constraint Application Protocol. It's a much lighter weight way of communicating between devices. Uh, how to deal with online offline. How would I send an offline message if it just went offline? It handles showing if the device is online or not. Updating firmware over the air, that comes free out of the box. A lot of things that make it really easy to write a professional connected device are just handed to you in this little $30 chip. Or if you're using the Photon, now that's $20. MongoDB we really like for rich data structures. Uh, there's the nice part of it's scalable. I went to Mongo World last summer. Scale the universe is their Mongo. Uh, but for us, it was trying to think of like, OK, there's a lot going on in a Grove. A grove is any collection of those towers. So a grove has towers, and then a tower has plots. And one of those plots is a fish tank. And the tower also has pumps. And OK, the, the lights belong to the plots, so we have to put those in the plots. So we end up with this. This is our actual, mostly, of the grove document. So we look up here. The grove has a name. Make this full screen. And then it has an ID. The Grove has some variables we were looking at. It has ammonia, it has pH, nitrite, nitrate, air temperature, has some photos that we store if you're adding photos of it. Then we get into the interesting part, towers. OK, the tower is online. There's some plots. We have to number them, type, shallow. Each plot has a light schedule. So here, that's actually hiding like three more points in the schedule. And then each plot has all that. And then the tower also has a water capacity. It has a pump. The pump has a cycle. It's not just on or off. Serial number, the tower is numbered, the chip ID, 
We store some alarms about each tower, and then we can say whether the grove is cycling or not, which means if the chemistry of the system is really locked in yet. And what I want to show here, I don't have the code to show the class, but when we get this object from Mongo as a normal JSON object, we put it through our own constructor, and we make the grove, tower, and plot objects. And on those objects, we can actually call the things we need to do. So that's how I say tower.setOffline, tower.setLightSchedule, grove.setName. And you have this nice like object document mapper that we can make ourselves. And with Mongo, it gives you this really easy way of like, here's all the data you need. Here is what you expect. Because in Mongo, you design for the data you want. And all that's right there. So jumping forward to February 2015, this was a key, key moment because we got two more engineers. We got our embedded systems guy, who absolutely kills it. And we got another web developer from Seattle, Charles. Charles had the benefit of living in Seattle, where the tech scene, definitely the software scene, is bigger than Boston. Uh, and he went to some Facebook meetups and had heard about this thing called React and had built some things with it. So at that point, most of our application, all of our application was written with Blaze. And there was this huge thing that I had a problem with, which was session. Anytime you wanted to say, like, the current grove, the current thing, you put it on session. You would say the current user, you put it on session. All this spot, it's like this one big global state. And it just felt wrong. The big thing for me with React is that it, well, these are the big things. UI is a function. It has inputs. It has an output, the markup. It's a one-way data flow. Instead of trying to think, well, I mean, Meteor has a one-way data flow, so you guys understand that. But instead of like Angular, you're trying to manipulate the DOM yourself. It has reusable components. You can declare the interfaces that they have. Um, so if something needs text or it has a bunch of functions that may happen as a result of that, you put it right up front in prop types. You declare what your properties are. State and props are a thing. So rather than session, which is like the state for everything in Blaze, you have the state of each component. Everything has set state. So it makes sense right there. Like Your UI has a lot of state to it. The hardest thing about UI is reasoning about the state. And that's built right into React. Basically, you know exactly what to expect. When you look at a function, you know exactly how it works. You don't have to wonder what the data context is. Uh, if I touch this, will it break something else? It's very straightforward when you look at it, how it works. So I tried to come up with an example. Unfortunately. Our components are pretty big, but up top you see what this was about. There's a prop type. It expects a grove. So when I hand this grove dashboard a grove, it can just grab the things it needs off of it. It could grab grove.readings, but more importantly, it can call things on it. So it could say grove.setLightSchedule. It could say grove.turnPumpsOff. So this magical grove object is both your source of data and your class of how you actually call these functions. And it made it really easy to pass all these rich objects around when you just say, it's a prop. Here you go. So the theme among all these is that open source was huge for us. We, each, every single one of us is an amateur engineer. We're a junior engineer. This is our first job. Um, two of us had never worked, never built a web app before, certainly never a web system. We never could have built this system, gotten it into customers' hands, working well in less than six months, less than a year, but really less than six months when we actually had picked our stack and started building straight forward. Each of these has its own community. Each of these has great contributors. It's been like so nice meeting all of you. So the four of us could have never done this. I lied. We had three interns this summer who helped a lot. But all this is about standing on the shoulders of giants. This is a theme in software engineering. It's the industry we're in. You solve a problem, I get to use your solution. I make a solution, you get to use my solution. We stand on top of transistors, microchips, Linux, everything of the past 40 years. And you think about, of course I would release it. Like, I thought of a little bit of this stack. I'm going to give it back to you. So I also can't wait to release some of ours open source. So thank you to all of you. Thank you for having me. But really, thank you for being a part of this community. Uh, it's been sweet meeting a few of you who make the packages we use, from simple schema to all the velocity. Uh, like, it's like building on top of an escalator that you sit down, heads down for a while, and you look up, and you're like, whoa, Meteor 1.2. Like, there's ECMAScript. So it's really nice to be able to actually see the community. And if you're ever out in Boston, we have a pretty good meetup there, too. So as we say at Grove, Keep on killing it. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Hey, right, questions for Lewis. Uh, Rahul over here. What did your Wi-Fi setup experience look like, with Particle? <laughs> so the question was, what does our Wi-Fi setup experience look like with Particle? So we're nice. We only had 50 customers. We programmed every single one of them on the manufacturing line. We had to have them send their Wi-Fi credentials to us. At least five or seven of them had typos. One of them was like we had it inside the spreadsheet as a number, so it chopped off a leading zero. And not, Luckily, the Photon actually does have a way to set up Wi-Fi, but the Spark Core certainly was not a way to scale a product. You can pre-order this now. Um, so we're iterating on the, the hardware design. Uh, we're launching later this fall. Look for a crowdfund in about six weeks. Um, and we hope some of you will back us. Uh, we hadn't thought of branching out past edible, growing edible things. Um, he asked if, as a company, we're looking at expanding past just growing vegetables into things like uh, smoking meat or making beer. There actually is a really nice a product I can't remember right now that is like connected device for homebrew, um, so that does exist. But as a company, our mission is distributed agriculture. The, the way the world grows and distributes its food is wrong, so we're trying to be the company that not only enables you to grow that, but connects you to local, healthy, fresh, sustainable food. You can use the same app. Okay. Um, right now, with this design, you couldn't hook up more than four before the the water cycle just right. doesn't work well enough, okay. but it's all within the same app. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, he asked, uh, how many of them can you hook up, and is do you have to change the app interface at all? Cool. So when you set it up, it asks for your serial number, um, so it's all over the internet. None of it is to direct to the device. All right, any more questions? Okay, thank you so much, Lewis. Thank you. <laughs>